I'll check with you after work and see if you need a ride home wherever you're at. And he said, sounds good, Mom. I love you. And that was the last time I talked to him. I remember asking him if he was going to be home at, that night, and he, he said he was, and, but then we never heard from him again. That was Jeff and Marilyn McAllister, very concerned parents of missing person David McAllister. He's been missing for about two and a half years at this point. Of course, there's a very big question on everyone's mind. Is David still alive? Thankfully, when we look into his personality and hear from his family, it seems like he could be. We're going to go through those details, and today we're turning on the searchlight for David McAllister. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. Before we look into David's case, a very quick update. A couple of weeks ago, we featured the case of Adrian Quintal on Searchlight. We then moved it to Brain Scratch last week because of a lot of the developments with the information coming out and many new questions in that case. Of course, if you saw that episode, we interviewed um, her sister, Jenny. At that time, they didn't have a Facebook page put together for the search for Adrian, so Jenny was using her personal Facebook account. Um, since then, they have created a new Facebook page specifically for the search for Adrian. So in the links down below in the description box, you'll find a link to that group. Please follow or like that group so you can keep up to date on the latest developments with the search for Adrian. I've also gone into the video from last week and I've changed the link um, for Jenny's personal Facebook page to this new one for the search for Adrian. So if you're looking to keep up to date with developments on that case, Adrian Quintal Missing in Northern Michigan is the name of that Facebook page. All right, continuing on to today's case. This is David McAllister. Now, I've listened to a podcast on this case, uh, another YouTube video, I checked that out on this case. Of course, all my sources are in the links down below, so you can dive into those uh, after you're done with today's video if you would like. But one thing was pretty clear to me from the information that I've been reviewing, and that's David, first of all, had some personal struggles. Um, people aren't being very clear about what those personal struggles are, but I can tell you after looking through his personal Facebook posts, some of them seem to be referencing um, some type of narcotic abuse or maybe alcohol abuse. Um, so there's, a, there's some sobriety messages that I'm seeing coming through in his Facebook page. So I don't know if he was still struggling with that. I don't know if there's something else that was going on in his life personally. Uh, he used to ride BMX bikes, and I think he banged himself up pretty good doing that. Apparently, he limps on his right leg a little bit. Um, but outside of all that, he's what a lot of people would consider a free spirit. It seems like he's the type of guy that would decide to take a train ride and just head off to a different state for a little while. Um, but typically when he would do that, his family would kind of know about it and he would pack up some of his things, put a backpack together and then head off kind of for you know his own little adventure. Um, I don't know if that's what we have going on in today's case, but being that type of personality, um, it could be a, a light of hope in this case. And I want to kind of keep that in mind as we're going through today's details. Let's start at NamUs to see what we can learn about this. Date of last contact here they have listed as May 10th, 2017. There's some varying information on that. Um, it's either the, the 10th or the 11th. Uh, we'll get into some more of those details, but quite honestly, I still can't quite make sense of it. He's missing from Bettendorf, Iowa. That's where he was living at the time. But from what I understand, when they last contacted him, he was actually in a neighboring city in the Quad Cities, Iowa area. We'll get into more about that. Uh, he went missing at the age of 22. Currently, it's saying he would be 24 years old. But I do. I saw a post from his mother on the Facebook page saying that uh, his birthday is coming up this month, so he should be turning 25. David Allen McAllister stands at five foot nine weighs around 160 pounds, and is a white Caucasian. Uh, here's the circumstances of disappearance. David was last seen at his home in Bettendorf, Iowa on May 10th, 2017. But then this next sentence kind of throws it. Uh, David left in the early hours of May 11th, 2017, and said he would return that evening. So 
I'm wondering if maybe someone actually saw him at the home on the 10th, and then before they were up on the 11th, he actually left the home. Maybe that's what makes sense about this date discrepancy. I, I'm not 100% sure. His cell phone has not been used since before noon on that day, I suppose they're talking about the 11th, around Vanderveer Park in Davenport, Iowa, and that's the neighboring city that I was mentioning. He's not made contact with family, which is out of the norm and hasn't been seen since. David enjoys camping and hiking. Of course, cell phone hasn't been used, and it seems like um, access to his finances also hasn't happened. Now, I don't think he had a lot of money, so it could be if he did want to go kind of off grid, uh, perhaps fall into some type of um, you know counterculture group or something like that. It could be that he's doing that and not really reaching for any money that he had left in his in his checking account or, or things along that nature, but. Let's continue her physical description. Hair color, they have it listed as blonde, strawberry, but then in the head hair description, they say dark blonde, medium length. And you can see in the photo, um, yeah, the lighter areas certainly uh, get a, a kind of a strawberry blonde kick, but there's a lot of dark brown um, tones in there as well. Eye color is blue. Uh, he does have his ears pierced, and there is a lot of tattoos. We're going to wait till we get to the Charlie Projects page to review the tattoos so you can kind of see pictures with the descriptions. For clothing, they're saying here um, he was last known to be wearing a black shirt, jeans, and black Converse tennis shoes, but we're going to see other information that says maybe they're not so sure about the clothing description. Um, in terms of the photos on the NamUs profile, a couple different photos of his face. Unfortunately, no photos at all of his tattoos, and that's a little bit of an oversight. I wish they would update the NamUs profile with the information from the Charlie Project, basically, and get all those photos of the tattoos over there. Um, over at Quad Cities Missing Persons Network Facebook page, we get a little bit of a different detail. He was last seen at home in Bettendorf on May 10th. He left in the early morning, so unsure of what clothing he may have been wearing. The last contact was early morning on May 11th, 2017. He indicated he would be home that evening, but did not show. He does not have a car. So no mode of transportation, but uh, this is someone that was friendly with the train system. I'm sure he was probably friendly with um, public transportation systems as well. Someone that could certainly get around on public transportation systems. Uh, it's just another aspect to keep in mind and maybe just another little thing to pump that beacon of hope that we keep looking for in these cases. Here is the Charlie Project page and you can see um, Megan always does such a wonderful job pulling together all these photos. But his look can vary pretty significantly. Um, his hair, you know, sometimes it looks like it's it's more blown out. Other times it, it doesn't. Uh, if you throw some sunglasses on him and a bandana it can vary up his look very significantly. This is someone that I don't think would have a very hard time um, kind of changing up his look to disappear if he wanted to disappear. And that's really obviously a big question in this case. But we've got a 22-year-old struggling with something. His family isn't being exactly clear about what that is. Um, the, the, the makings are there of a case where he might have disappeared into some type of group or some type of lifestyle and uh, perhaps is living in that right now. We have seen cases like that before on this show in particular. Uh, but let's learn about his tattoos. McAllister has the following tattoos. An unfinished yellow and black tattoo of a cross surrounded by thorns covering up a goat on his arm. And just to get another sense of his personality, first of all, looking at these photos, you can see he's got a cigarette and a lot of pictures. So obviously uh, a smoker. Um, I've seen some comments where it seems like maybe what people would consider a heavy smoker. Here is the picture of the tattoo that is a cover-up job. And you can see the image that's going on top of it looks pretty religious to me. I, I imagine that this is going to get like a stained glass look as he's getting the rest of it colored in. But what was under it originally might give us a little insight into uh, his personality and his struggles a little bit. I believe that this is what it's covering up. And it, it does kind of look like, I guess you would say a goat, you could see the horns, but there's also a pretty obvious pentagram that is in the center of the forehead 
on that image. Um, from what his family is saying, he has really pushed into religion, I think in particular over the past few years. So I think that's a strong indicator of it. Obviously, he went from one type of very strong, almost extreme imagery to the other with such a religious depiction like he has on there now. But let's hear more about these. Um, he has a peace sign on the back of his right shoulder, a yin yang symbol on his left shoulder. Once again, uh, the yin yang, you could probably take that in consideration with the artwork that we saw change with the religious stuff on his shoulder as well. Someone that certainly looks at, you know, the polarity in this world, at the, at the different ways of existing. Um, a marijuana leaf and 420 on his calf, a row of five stars on the right side of his chest, the word beer on the left side of his chest, an anarchy symbol between the thumb and forefinger on his right hand. So once again, we're, we're getting some imagery of if, if I'm looking for indicators of him going for a counterculture lifestyle or wanting to disappear with what some would consider, you know, a bunch of hippies out in the woods somewhere. I'm seeing some some good indicators here for that possibility. Um, he's got the word stay on the inside of his right elbow and the word true on the inside of his, I think it's his left elbow. Um, I know it's the other side. I might have them reversed. She's saying right elbow on both of them, but I know that they're on different arms. Here they are. So basically when you put them together, it says stay true. Uh, I believe that would be stay is on his right and true is on his left. And he's also got mushrooms on the top of his foot. Once again, you know, we've got some references here, um, possibly a little bit of a partying lifestyle that this guy is going for. Uh, also notes, once again, his ears are pierced. I don't really, yeah, we see a little ring kind of in his left ear there. Uh, oh, looks like maybe a hoop, um, like a, a gauged hoop on the right side as well. So um, other things that I picked up from his Facebook page, really just his love of BMX comes across pretty clear in the photo section, uh, particularly when he was younger. Um, got a picture of him on a motorcycle here as well. Nirvana is kind of his banner across the page. We see he's wearing a Nirvana shirt here as well. You know, a bunch of empty beer cans and cigarette butts. Um, I think this, this picture really calls it out. I mean, the possibility of him living as a, I don't know if it's even right to use the word hippie anymore, but um, it, it, it's kind of clear to me that this is a guy that is very earthy um, and a free spirit. I think that's that's probably the better way to, to say it. Let's get into the details of this case a little bit from the news. This is over at kwqc.com, and this was posted September uh, of 2017. So unfortunately, a little after the original uh, missing persons report was filed. On May 26, 2017, the mother of 22-year-old David Allen McAllister, let me keep his photos in here, uh, filed a missing persons report with the Bettendorf Police Department. McAllister was last seen by his mother on May 10th, and the last known contact anyone had with him was the next day on May 11th. Officials say McAllister may have been experiencing personal issues at the time of his disappearance. They say he was possibly last seen in the area of Vanderveer Park, Jung Park, or 35th Street at Harrison Street in Davenport. So now that we got some locations, let's take a look at a map and make sense of all this. I don't have uh, a home address listed for him, so I just had Bettendorf as a starting location, and typically that picks kind of the center of the city. So we can see that here. Bettendorf, very close to the Mississippi River, which is the border for Iowa and Illinois. Um, it looks like a little over five miles away is Vanderveer Botanical Park. I saw a, a video interview where his family says this is a place where he actually liked to hang out. Uh, so this is uh, an area that he would frequent. And I believe this is where the ping from his last phone call is showing where he was. And uh, it might be more than a ping, it's probably GPS related information. I don't know where the Jung Park keeps coming into this. Um, I see it mentioned time and time again as a place where he possibly was at, but I don't know why. I don't know if it's a friend that said that. I don't know if there's cell phone information that leads to that. But here is the Young Park area, and then here is 35th Street, and Harrison is right here. So essentially, even by saying 35th and Harrison, you're once again talking about the uh, Young Park area. Now, 
if we go to satellite view, you can see Young Park is actually what looks like a cluster of baseball diamonds kind of crowded around a creek called Duck Creek. Um, this isn't exactly like a wilderness area. I'm pretty sure that um, if you were going to conduct a search here, it wouldn't take too big of a team and you'd probably knock it out pretty quickly. So the likelihood that he would still be in this area if there was some type of situation where he had an accident or something along those lines, I don't know if it's very high. Um, I believe that they probably have searched this area pretty thoroughly. And quite honestly, the other park is even smaller than this. These are not giant areas. You know, we've got water sources, which of course are obviously something we always watch for when we're talking about missing persons cases like this. Um, but this water source is a lagoon. And once again, it, it looks like a nice park. It's just, there's not a lot to it. Um, I just I, I don't think that the possibility of him being in one of these two areas still to this day is very high. Uh, let's learn a little bit about this area. Both of these parks are in Davenport. Davenport is the largest of the Quad Cities, a, a metropolitan area with a population estimate of about 382,000 people. That's for the Quad Cities. Davenport in particular has a population of around 100,000 people. Um, so that's what we're talking about. A lot of people in that area. Um, I would like to think a lot of potential for witnesses if something bad had happened to them. And we're really not hearing that. So once again, might be kind of a, a, a push towards that beacon of hope and light that we're always looking for. Um, the other thing is around these parks. Um, this one looks like it's primarily residential that's around this park. You do have a church on the south end of it. Um, so I don't know about the possibility of cameras picking him up around Vanderveer Park, but around Jung Park, there does seem to be, we've got a pizza pub and grill that's right across the way. Um, once again, kind of houses on the south end, but a lot of businesses on the north end. So I would think there's probably a pretty good chance of some cameras that might have been able to pick him up. Unfortunately, we're going to hear from the family. Um, they don't feel like investigators really looked into that all that strongly at the time. Uh, it kind of seems like I think investigators might have the same feeling that I do when I look into this case. The possibility of him deciding that he's going to, um, you know, go check out the country for a couple years could be a good possibility. Now, I would like to think that investigators that are working a missing person a missing persons case professionally wouldn't let their gut feeling kind of guide them in that way. But we're going to hear from uh, some quotes from the family and and really get a feeling for what they think in terms of how this investigation has gone. One of the main headlines that moved me to actually cover this case was this one: "Dad of missing man wants help from you." Uh, it is so strongly worded. Uh, I really wish that more families could get headlines like that. It just really grabbed me and pushed me towards making this video and sharing it with all of you out there. Uh, this is actually a photo uh, or, or a video segment of his father being interviewed. 204 days with no contact, said Jeff McAllister. David left his mom's house in Bettenford early on the morning of May 10th. His cell phone has not been used since May 11th. He had no car and not much money. He's a great kid, a kind heart, his father said. McAllister says the family and David's friends have no clue what happened. Some days are better than others. Some are very hard. His birthday was last Sunday. Obviously, that was very a very hard day for us. The holidays are coming up. It's different. There's a piece missing, and we'd really like to see him back, he said. Um, so if his birthday was last Sunday and this article was posted December 4th, yeah. So basically his birthday's coming up at the end of November. And of course, you've got uh, you know Thanksgiving holidays, families getting together. So I imagine um, it's not the same without their son there. Uh, he also has two other brothers. Um, and I, I think there's probably an, an empty spot at that Thanksgiving table that everyone is hoping someday they will see David in again. Continuing with another article at kwqc.com. Now we have the time just kind of start passing on this case. One year later, family of missing man asks for your help. Once again, just a very strong headline being very clear. I did call him on the phone and talk to him, his father said. 
He indicated that he would be home that night. Obviously, he never showed. We have not seen or heard from him since. Officials say he may have been experiencing personal issues. Once again, no additional detail on what that is. Uh, and let me just throw out to the family at this point, if you want to come on the channel and help us understand a bit more of what's going on with David at this time, it might be helpful to get that information out. Sometimes there's indicators in that for what he might be doing, or it could um, alert people in certain circles to the fact that they might need to be looking for someone like this. So if you would like to come on the channel, please contact me at the email address you see on the screen right now. We will certainly work that out. Anything that I can do to, to help you with this, um, I absolutely will do it. Just, just please reach out to me and we'll, we'll get that done. Um, Jeff says David was independent and resourceful, but always kept in touch. He and his mother were very close. It would be very unusual for him not to contact her on a regular basis, said his father, Jeff. We pray every day that we'll find something, an answer of some kind. Ideally, he would come home and be fine, but we're realistic and know that might not be the case. And it is important as much as I'm looking at this guy's personality and I'm saying, hey, there's a really good chance that he's out there somewhere. And I have seen cases where people have disappeared into what you would consider counterculture movements for a period of years before. Um, we just don't know. There could be something else at play here. And unfortunately, the details aren't really helping us with that. Uh, when I did go through his Facebook page, I did see one post in particular. It was kind of interesting because most of his posts are just reposts of other things. But in one in particular, he was calling out um, some people that he seemed to be having a disagreement with. Now, that was back in 2015, but it seemed like there was a little rough talk going on there. So I don't know if this is the type of guy that would have a lot of enemies. We're really not getting any of that type of information here. I don't know if he had any recent disputes with people that might be a reason for him to disappear. I don't know if he had legal trouble that might be a, a reason for him to disappear. There's a lot of considerations here that we just don't know. And that's part of the reason why I want to put out the message to the family and offer you guys uh, every opportunity that, that you would need to come on the channel here as much time as you want to help explain all that maybe give us some more insight and help the public help you guys more. That's that's kind of what I'm really hoping uh, with this whole effort and any subsequent episodes that we do about David. Uh, but let's continue here at ourquadcities.com. 500 days and no word from David McAllister. David McAllister's parents told Local 4 News they haven't seen a lot of promising leads to bring them back to their son. Jeff and Marilyn McAllister told Local 4 News, this has been extremely stressful for them and David's two brothers. They told us they've been working with police and a number of different groups for missing persons. They've also launched a dedicated Facebook page to help reach out. And of course, I'll have a link to that down below as well. David's mother, Marilyn McAllister said, there's days where it's like, I can't believe that he's really missing. It's like a bad dream. And someday I'm just going to wake up from all this and everything's going to be fine. I certainly hope that's true, Marilyn. Um, he had a heart of gold. He literally several times took clothes off of himself and gave to people. He had a brand new pair of Converse tennis shoes and he took them off and gave them to someone because they needed them more than he did, said Marilyn. They add, while he's taken extended trips across the country and can care for himself, this isn't like the other times David has traveled. Marilyn said, he didn't take anything but a backpack and a Bible. He didn't take any clothes or food or nothing. My gut tells me he's not living on earth anymore. But with that being said, even if he's not, I need to find his body. And obviously, it's a reality that no one wants to face. But when you're stuck in that position of not knowing where your missing loved one is, it's something that you have to consider. Um, and I almost wonder if it's a psychological need for us to kind of prepare ourselves for that news uh, to come our way. Uh, I hope that's not the outcome in this case. There's one case I keep thinking about in particular, and I don't want to share her name because her family asked me to essentially remove the videos once she was found. But it was this story. It was her taking off, her getting into a counterculture movement, her staying there for a prolonged period of time. What happened in that case was eventually some pictures of someone that looked a lot like her 
trickled out, got to the family and the family's like, you know, they sent them to me and they're like, John, do you think this is her? And I was looking, she had a lot of artwork, a lot of tattoos, just like we've got in this case. I was telling them, I think it could be, but we, we need to kind of remain cautious. It actually did turn out to be her. She is back at home with her family now. So these cases can go in very unexpected ways. If there is an aspect to a foul play situation going on here, I'm not getting any indicator of that um, from the information that's been publicly released from his family or from the authorities. And I look into enough of these cases to know when family suspects a, a strong possibility of a foul play situation, they talk about it. Um, I, I think the interview we did on Brain Scratch last week points to that perfectly. And in that case, there's a lot of potential possibilities with what happened with Adrian. Um, I'm just not getting that in this case. So that's why I told you guys about that one Facebook post. But like I said, it was years ago. I don't think it ties to this directly. I, I'm just wondering about his personality. Was he, he doesn't seem like the type that's like a scrapper to me, especially uh, with the lifestyle that he seems to be leading. So I don't know. Would someone actually want to harm David? Uh, I'm not sure. And I think that leaves another possibility here that we need to consider some type of accident. Maybe he did decide to go traveling. Maybe something happened. Maybe he went off for a walk somewhere and something happened. That possibility always exists as well. But two and a half years is a long time of not knowing where, where your, your missing loved one is. Um, I also just have to throw this out as a possible consideration here. Uh, seeing that his life may have gone from one extreme to another, if he was in a situation where he was potentially having a relapse of some kind, or if he was starting to push back to those darker elements in him, whatever he was struggling with, whatever it is, not, I'm not necessarily saying it was drugs, but whatever that struggle was, if he was embarrassed about pushing back over to that other side, could that be enough motivation for him to try to steer clear of his family? I know shame can be a very strong motivator for some people, particularly in situations like that. And sometimes they don't want their family to see if they're getting sick again or going dark again or being depressed again. And sometimes they'll separate themselves. So I'm kind of wondering if we have some aspect like that going on here as well. But we just don't know not enough about his struggle to be able to really push too far into any serious talk on that. Over at Quad City Times, this is, I think, the latest post. Yeah, May 7th, 2019. Once again, a bit of an anniversary of his disappearance post, but we get some interesting input from his family here about what they think has been going on with the investigation. Uh, this is a picture of his mother. She sits on a picnic table under the pavilion in June Park on Tuesday, the last place he was seen alive. I'm reading that to you guys because... I haven't found any additional details about that sighting. I don't know who it is that saw him there. I don't know how trustworthy that information is. And like I told you, I think the ping actually came from the other park. So can we even lean on this information? It seems like she is. She's going there to hand out posters. Um, but I'm just very curious where that detail is coming from. Even when he was traveling, I always heard from him on Mother's Day and my birthday. But the call didn't come on Mother's Day 2017, and it didn't come in 2018, and I haven't seen any updates, so I think we can assume it didn't come in 2019 either. But as frequently happens with these cases, um, sometimes having the pain of not knowing motivates people to do pretty amazing things, and we have that happen in this case. Marilyn has earned her certification in search and rescue through the Quad Cities Missing Persons Network. It makes me feel like I'm doing something, she said. My next goal is to get a German Shepherd puppy to train as a cadaver search dog. We've got nothing like that around here. Bettendorf Police Chief Keith Kimball said cadaver dogs have twice been brought out to the Quad Cities to help search for David. In the two years since he last was seen at Jung Park in Davenport, the chief said the case has grown cold. Based on a tip, we had a helicopter up. Uh, a tip led to the river, so we searched up and down. We've also done numerous interviews with individuals over the years, all according to the chief. Marilyn wishes the police would do more. She said no one checked security cameras near Jung Park, 
Police did not pursue David's cell phone records and police interviewed just a handful of his friends. Um, and this is something we frequently talk about. I, I got to tell you guys, I think just about every single family that I speak to that has a missing loved one, uh, this conversation comes up. The police, at some point, you're going to get frustrated with the investigation. Um, and sometimes it's warranted, sometimes it's not. But it's always important to remember that this is a team that you have to put together to solve this problem. And you don't know where this problem leads. If it does come back that there is some type of foul play situation that happened to David here, you're certainly going to want those investigators on your side. So it, I think it's important to to kind of challenge them, but to not burn that bridge, to kind of remind them that you're there and you're looking for your answers, but not, you know, hit them up so hard that they actually shy away from answering your phone calls and stuff like that. Unfortunately, for Marilyn, uh, it doesn't sound like she's getting the best support when it comes to that. Let's continue here. Uh, this is a quote from the chief. We feel for the family. We want answers for the family. People have nowhere to put their anguish. We sometimes get the brunt of it, and I understand that. The police department's social worker is in routine contact with McAllister, uh, who said she's frustrated by the lack of communication with the investigator assigned to her son's case. She said the officer never has returned her phone calls. I'm interested to hear in this case that there is a social worker because it's pretty rare that I hear about that being offered to these families at all. Uh, and in some cases, I do hear the investigators are um, helpful and communicative, and in other cases, they're not. But I don't know if I've ever heard of the officer has never returned her phone calls. That is pretty rare. And certainly concerning um, for a family and for observers of what's going on with this case. I mean, why can't you just give her a call back, you know, talk to her once about the case, let her know why you can't communicate with them so often. Um, there's, there's things you could put into place to handle this, you know, you can kind of set an expectation of, hey, hey look, I can't keep you guys up to date on a day to day basis. But once a month, you know, uh, give me a call. And if there's some new development, I'll let you know about it. And if once a month is too, month, too much, make it once every two months, but just some expectation of um, communication with a person actually working the case. I don't think that's too much to ask. And I know these, these people are busy, but we're talking about a phone call. And it could be as simple as, hey, nice to hear from you. I'm sorry, we don't have any updates. Um, we're waiting for the next tip. And that could be it. I think that would go a huge distance to help families in this situation. One way the family is getting David's name and photo into the public eye is this weekend's motorcycle ride, dubbed Doing It For David Group Ride For A Cause. Participants are asked to donate $10 and ride together in David's name. Of course, David's dad will be a part of the pack and also the McAllister's youngest son, Sean. I think that's a really cool way to raise awareness. You know, on the case cracked we had this week, we had a father that was bicycling across Europe trying to raise exposure to his missing son. Uh, a bit of a similar take on it here. You know, a, a large event like that, you get the community aware of it, and then you're all riding bikes through town, and other people that aren't aware of it are going to ask, hey, what's that about? Oh, that's that ride for David. Um, they're selling t-shirts also, which I'm sure a bunch of the riders are going to wear. Uh, just a really good idea. And of course, you guys know, I'm always looking for good ideas to share on this channel so that other families in these positions uh, can also hopefully employ those ideas. I, I really like this one. So there is thankfully already a Facebook page for the search for David, bring David McAllister home. I'll have a link to that in the description box down below. And there is a recent post here from his mother um, written kind of directly to him. So I just wanted to share this with all of you. Where are you, David McAllister? Still missing two years and five months. No mother should have to wonder every day where her son is. I've done that for two years and five months wonder every day. Where are you, David? The weather is changing. It's getting colder. Are you cold? Are you alone? Are you afraid? Do you miss me as much as I miss you? Your 25th birthday is next month. Where are you? I miss you so much. Please come home. I love you and I will never give up. Love, mom. 
a very heartfelt message, and I truly hope that David is out there and David gets to see that message for himself. It could be um, a motivating factor in terms of him coming home. I did just want to share one other uh, story before we end today's video. I actually was considering doing this as an episode of Searchlight. Um, I had the cousin of the missing person reach out to me. I started looking into the case, but there was just no coverage on it. I think I found like literally two news articles on it, but I kept checking every single week when I'd be ready for doing another episode of Searchlight, I would look at this case again and look at this case again. Well, this week I went to look at this case again and thankfully an amazing outcome that maybe ties into what we're talking about with today's case. This is a article over at WCHS. Missing woman gets reunited with family after weeks on the street. Uh, essentially, we had a missing person, mother of three, you know, it's the same situation you hear about all the time. She wouldn't do this. She wouldn't disappear. She has three kids. No one knows where she is. Her name is Ashley Mullins. But the real special people, I think, in this story are these two. Phyllis Spencer and her sister-in-law, Anna Brewer, were on duty with the Kanawha County Emergency Ambulance Authority in October when they noticed a woman living on the streets nearby. Instead of looking on, they decided to ask if she needed help. They essentially brought her blankets, brought her food, built up a relationship with her. And then at some point, one of them had the thought of, you know what, we should probably look into some missing persons posters and see if she could be missing, if there's a family out there that could be caring for her and she just isn't connected with them. And that's exactly what they did. And that's exactly how they found the family of Ashley Mullins. They reached out to them. They are now reconnected. Um, it does happen. And I really just wanted to make sure that we, Searchlight is about light. It is about hope. I wanted to make sure that we brought that to the story of David McAllister today. And I, I don't only have that one case where I can't talk about the name, but here's another example where sometimes people do leave of their own accord. And sometimes they're just waiting for some type of sign or nudge to reconnect them with their family. And thankfully, this one came... Um, from two people who work in an ambulance already out there saving lives and might have very well saved Ashley's life as well. In the links down below, I will have a link to a web sleuths thread about David's case. Uh, also a Reddit post that features a video um, with a show called Destination Unknown featuring some information on David's case. I'll also have a link down there to Mysteriously Missing's episode on David McAllister. And by the way, Mysteriously Missing, if you hear this, I really, really appreciate your uh, approach with stories and uh, getting the facts out there. Really, really good work. But this is the man we're looking for. David McAllister left home with his Bible and a black backpack and his cell phone but it hasn't been on since May 11th, uh, last pinged at the park. Um, I'm honestly not 100% sure which park it is at this point, but it was in Davenport. Hiker, camper, train rider, smoker, walks with limping right ankle, several scars from his BMX days, enjoys music, nightlife, and beaches, likes church and church gatherings. As a matter of fact, it could be that he's moving from uh, one church community to another as he's getting across the country as well, capable of traveling across the country. And of course, all the contact information that you need is in the description box down below. So if you have seen David McAllister or you have some information that can help his family, please use that contact info and send it in to them. Before we end today's episode, I have to thank a few new patrons, Francis J. Pitts. Thank you so much, Francis. And Carly Surgeoner, hope I'm saying that right, Carly. But thank you both for supporting the channel. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do that over at www.lordandarts.com, where you can sign up for Patreon, PayPal, buy merchandise, buy the audiobook. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing helping these families and spending time with all of you. If you have friends in the Iowa, in the state of Iowa, please share this with them. But keep in mind, David might be traveling. So quite honestly, this is a video that you could be sharing all over the country to help his family. Take care, everyone. I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel.